to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of Genesis. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son is this of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is of your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of my child. And as she opposed, and as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, 
brought trouble, do, you, do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and, gave, and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. the letter of Paul to the Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a re resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin. 
once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you almost also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now Jesus said to his twelve apostles, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more they will malign those of his household. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light and what you hear whispered proclaim from housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Neither fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and a daughter against his mo her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will destroy, lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord God. And murder mysteries. And when it comes to murder mysteries, 
is I have really enjoyed the exploits of the fictional Los Angeles detective named Harry Bosch. Perhaps some of you have read some of those books. This character, created by Michael Conley, has appeared in over 35 novels. And I think I've made my way through the whole series. But one aspect of the Bosch character that I really like is his personal mantra, which is, everybody matters or nobody matters. Everybody matters or nobody matters. And what this means to him is that every case that he works, no matter if it is a Hollywood celebrity or an undocumented migrant worker, that case receives his full effort. Because once you start deciding that one life is more important than another, you start down a moral and ethical slippery sliding slope, which leads to a place where all life becomes relevant. Everybody matters, or nobody matters. This phrase struck me last week, as I, along with millions of people around the world, watched as a fleet of ships from the American Navy and the American Coast Guard and the Canadian Navy searched for possible survivors from the Titan, that small submarine, taking people down to see the wreck of the Titanic. It seemed to me like the whole world was watching, wondering whether these five people on board were still alive, whether their air run out before they were discovered. I think we all had images in our head of what it might be like to be trapped in that small submarine, knowing almost to the minute when your oxygen would be depleted. I think the whole world was hoping against hope that the ship would be discovered and we would see scenes reminiscent of the, and I'm going to date myself, in the old days of the Gemini and Mercury and Apollo space flights when the main divers would open up the hatch on the capsule that splashed down in the ocean and the crew would emerge safely into the sun and into the fresh air. Well, of course, we know that did not happen. We know that five people perished just within a few hours of that initial descent. And now their ship and their remains rest 1,600 feet from the wreck of that Titanic, along with the 1,500 other people who died when that ship went down. The Titan was last, lost last Sunday, maybe as we were even sitting here last Sunday. Last week on Wednesday, I was listening to a BBC radio coverage of the recovery effort. And the reporter was talking about all the efforts that were being made to find the Titan. And they interviewed naval experts about the way that that submarine was constructed and about the difficulty of retrieving anything from those great depths. And then, at the top of the hour, the regular news came on. And there was a short 20 second news story about the sinking of a boat carrying migrant workers off the coast of Spain. And that ship sank with 40 people who were all presumed dead. The world hung on with bated breath, waiting to hear about the fate of the five people in that submarine. But the deaths of 40 people died in the same week, in the same ocean, barely warranted more than a few words on the news. And then all of a sudden, the words of Harry Bosch came flooding back into my mind. Everybody matters, or nobody matters. I see, I think the subtext of the story is, and a few people were brave enough to say it, and a lot of other people were thinking it. I think the subtext of the story is that if you are a rich, white, an explorer, and you disappear in a sleek, sexy submarine, you matter. But if you're a poor, minority, migrant worker, and you die on a leaky ferry boat, your life is worth much, much less.
Jesus asked his disciples, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs on your head, on all of our heads, are all counted. So don't be afraid, because we all are of more value than a sparrow. Don't be afraid, because in the eyes of God, we all count. To the, uh, in the eyes of God, everybody matters. If we are honest with ourselves, we all have this continuum buried somewhere deep down in our psyche with everybody matters on one end and nobody matters on the other end. And we all have some kind of formula that we use to decide where we place people on that continuum. Friends, family, people we love, they matter. A racist cop, maybe not so much. A sick child in a hospital with an IV in their arm matters. A serial killer strapped to a gurney with an IV in his arm, maybe not so much. People who live in our, in our neighborhoods matter. People who live over there, not so much. People who look like us and pray like us and vote like us and live like us, they matter. The people who look differently, pray to God in a different way, pray to a different God altogether, or have ideas that we can't reconcile with our own way of thinking, maybe not so much. There's an old Irish blessing that goes, may those that love us, love us, and for those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts and if he can't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we know them by their limping. Maybe we don't pray for people, maybe we don't wish somebody to die, but I think we all have a list in our head of people who we don't like and people who we hope God will turn their ankles. And when we do that, when we start making that list, when we start deciding who matters and who doesn't matter as much, we set ourselves down that road to perdition. Everybody matters or nobody matters. Three years ago, at this exact time, three years ago, people in our country and many people around the world were enraged by the death of George Floyd. He was killed on May 28th. People took to the streets. Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement was birthed and was in full force. But all too often, our short attention spans wane. And I think for some of us, as we drive down the street now and we see a Black Lives Matter sign in somebody's front yard, it seems like kind of a reminder of something that happened a while ago. So much has happened since then that this passion, I think, for racial reform, which flowed out into the streets three years ago, has been replaced by other things, like five guys trapped in a submarine. But for others, those signs are a reminder that little has changed since the death of George Floyd and being a person of color in our society is still a social and economic and humanitarian liability. For some of us, blue lights flashing in our rearview mirror is a sign that we're probably going to have to pay a fine, maybe have a few points added to our driving record. For others, those blue lights are harbingers of dread. Whether that's true or not, I don't think is the issue as much as why would a young black male who's about to be pulled over for some traffic 
and fraction, why would he even think that something horrible might happen to him if he says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing or makes a sudden movement? One thing that never changes, one thing that has never changed over the scope of time is God's love for us all. Regardless of our class or our race or our gender or our orientation or whatever tagline we like to use to describe people. And also what hasn't changed is God's presence with us. Depending on what translation we read from, Jesus says, fear not, or don't be afraid about 75 times in the New Testament. And the whole of the Bible, that phrase occurs over 350 times. And it's important to remember that when we hear that phrase, it's almost always God saying it, or Jesus saying it, or one of the prophets speaking on behalf of God saying it. It's not the apostles trying to blow each other up. It's not some devout, pious woman on the sidelines. It's God speaking to us, saying, do not be afraid. Because we all have fears in our lives, right? Even the richest person on earth, with virtually unlimited resources, embodies a certain amount of fear. No matter who we are, or how rich we are, fear paralyzes people. We lose sleep when we're afraid. Fear robs us of our peace, and it kills our joy, and it consumes our thoughts, and it dictates how we ask. Jesus said, fear not. He said, trust in God, and also trust in me. And essentially, Jesus was telling his disciples and telling us, hey guys, believe that I know what I'm doing. I've got it. You may not see it, but I am in control. I know exactly what is going on, and I'm not a helpless victim standing on the sidelines. I came to fulfill a purpose. I came into the world for the salvation of the whole world. I know what's going on, and that's why I'm here. That's why I promise to be with you always, even to the end of the ages. I think sometimes when things aren't going right in life, when we're in the grip of fear, we think, God has forgotten all about me. Even Jesus, hanging on the cross, cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we need to remember that oops is not a word in God's vocabulary. God doesn't make mistakes. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand or discern what God's purpose for us is in life. Sometimes it's hard for us to discern the circumstances that we find ourselves enmeshed in. But one thing that we never have to let go of is that God loves us. No matter what the mess we find ourselves in, No matter the joy that we're celebrating, God is there with us, walking with us, living our lives. And as Christians, we believe that God came down to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to do that exact thing. God loved us so much that Jesus came into the world to understand what our lives were like, to live our lives, to feel our pain, to experience our joys. God knows that. And at the end of time, All this will make sense to us in a way that it never did while we were here. So this week, as we go out into the world, I think the gospel message today calls us to think about two things. One, whose ankles do we want God to turn? We all have that list in our head, right? We all have biases. We all have prejudices. We all have people who we don't like. We all have people that don't like us. And sometimes in our worst moments, we wish bad things to happen to them. But also know that for every bad thing that we wish happens to somebody else, 
Somebody else higher up the food chain is wishing that that would happen to us. So we have to be very careful when we pray to God to turn people's ankles, because most likely the first ankle to be turned is going to be ours. And then secondly, that won't happen. God doesn't turn people's ankles. <laughs> Bad things happen in the world. A lot of times we bring it on ourselves. But it's not God's way of punishing us. I don't believe in a God who turns people's ankles or makes bad things happen to them to punish them for some sin or some wrongdoing or some egregious act. That's not a God I believe in. I believe in a God who loves us and cares for us and came down into the world in the person of Jesus to be with us and to experience our lives and to lead us to that place eventually where there's no pain, no sorrow, no crying, but joy and fulfillment. So this week, as we go out into the world, no turning ankles, and remember that God loves us constantly, even when we can't perceive it. Let us stand and profess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 6 in the Worship Bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceed from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers today, we remember the church around the world. We pray for Jeffrey, our bishop, and the standing committee of the diocese. We pray for the dean, the chapters, the staff, and the trustees of the Cathedral Corporation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember the church of Bangladesh. We remember the people and clergy of St. John's Cathedral and the people and clergy of our companion diocese of Nuala in Tanzania. We remember all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, including those on our parish prayer list, Polly, Carol, Eric, Sharon, Maggie, Chris, Pat, Judy, Pam, Melissa, Gerald, Susan, Noel, Dan, John, Beverly, Kay, Mariana, John, <coughs> George, Renata, Holly, 
Jeff, Gene, Phil, Jackie, Anne, and Cheryl. We remember those who celebrate birthdays this week, including Melissa Bratkovich, John Matthews, and Kathy Bauer. And those celebrating anniversaries, including Suzanne and Don Cornell, and John Ebersall, and Robert Hansen. And remember those who have died. The prayers of the people, let us pray for the church and the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort. Bless all those who live lives closely linked with ours and grant them we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to you, to your mercy, all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, whose perfect kingdom, no sword is drawn with the sword of righteousness, and no strength known but the strength of love. So, Michael, may speed abroad your spirit, that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace, as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to All Saints on this beautiful summer day. Special welcome to our visitors and guests, and we remind you that in the Episcopal Church, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion. We are experimenting this summer with receiving the wine in both individual glasses and from the common cup. So you can take your pick and um, maybe just a little subtle sign to the altar service to indicate which form you would like to receive communion in. Please join us following the service for coffee in the guild hall, which is through those doors and down the hall. And a special prayer for safe travels for all of you who will be
traveling next weekend during the 4th of July holiday. Walking along as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Yeah, that's true. Summerfield is close to the Methodist Church, so we, we offer our prayers and thanksgivings for the ministry that they have offered to this neighborhood, basically for the same amount of time, right around the same amount of time that we have. Um, I know it's a sorrow for people when their church closes, and so we pray for them that, that this won't be an impediment to their faith, that they'll find new places to live. They might even like to come here and visit. Invite them. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Mm -hmm.
You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. So we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet, you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. And the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he given thanks to you, he broke it, he gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Mary, the mother of our Lord, blessed Joseph, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name
Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Render unto no one evil for evil. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day 